The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive helps you compare direct auto rates from a variety of companies so you can find a great one, even if it's not with them. Quote today at Progressive.com to find a rate that works with your budget. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states and situations. Jennifer Harris disappeared from Bonham, Texas on Mother's Day 2002. The secrets in the Jennifer Harris case have been hidden for 20 years. When someone disappears, you have to look at who would benefit from their disappearance. What happened to Jennifer Harris and who is responsible for her death? Coming May 10th, Final Days on Earth, Season 2, The Life and Death of Jennifer Harris. Available wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, it's one of the great mysteries of the sea. Ships respond to a distress call from another vessel, only to find everyone on board dead. Or did they? Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my ironclad co-host, Alice. <laughs> Nothing about me is ironclad. I'm not even exactly sure what it means in that context. You're like unsinkable, undefeatable, uh... unconquerable. See, I'm using all these words now that I can Or use I am ironclad and sink straight to the bottom. Well, that's true, but actual ironclad ships did not sink to the bottom. And the cannonballs just bounced right off of them, Alice. Thank just you for saying that. bounced off of them like they were nothing. Cannonballs do not bounce off of me at all, and it feels like a never-ending onslaught of cannonballs. But this podcast is an escape from it all. It's true. It's true. And today, I mean, look. I am very excited today because we have another mystery of the sea. And you know what that means, Alice. Are you going to have musical interludes? Sea shanties. (laughs) Oh, yes. yes. It is time for sea shanties because you can't talk about mysteries of the sea without sea shanties. And it's been too long. We haven't had a sea shanty on this show since before sea shanties became cool. I just want to point that out. We were doing sea shanties before everybody else was doing sea shanties, so there. We sure were. There are so many good sea shanties now. My personal favorite is the the possum one. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know if I know the possum one. Oh, I will have to send it to you after we finish recording. Should possums be on the sea? They should not be on the sea, but this man is feeding a possum through his window like jam. Oh, I have seen that. I know what you're talking about. I don't know who that guy is, but he is genius. Yeah, that was a great one. Yeah, and then that's where I learned that possums couldn't get rabies from that song. So there you go. Somebody suggested I call you Awesome Possum. Oh, that say, would have uh, been so perfect. Thank that's you. A good Thank one. you. Maybe I should just delete that part and then do it later. Maybe, know. but Ironclad is so good because today our mystery has to do with a boat. Exactly, a ship even. Ship even. And Alice, we had special help in preparing this episode. We absolutely did. So this is just to show you that we really mean it when we say reach out to us. So we had an amazing listener who is a teacher at the Lidditz Elementary School reach out to us and say, we would love to partner with you with a historical mystery and our students want to research and present their theories to you. And they did. So a huge thank you to the sixth grade class of Lidditz Elementary led by their wonderful teacher, Alex. We got to meet with them over Zoom. We saw their theories and their questions. And let me tell you, Brett, 
we better be watching out because I think they are doing a better job researching and coming up with theories than I ever did at that age or even today. And you're going to hear some of their theories today because they changed the way we thought about this case. And it was an absolute joy and privilege to get to hear from them. Yes, it was incredible. And I got to say, we definitely learned from them. And I'm a little nervous because like you said, they did such a good job. And, you know, it was one of those things that gives you hope for the future because they were really inspirational and, and smart and thoughtful and really thought through the evidence in this case. And Alex is one of those teachers you want to have and you want your kids to have. And we really enjoyed it. And I hope that we do them proud in this episode. Well, guys, let's tell you what we're talking about. We are talking about the Orang Medan. It's one of the great mysteries. You know, we love classic mysteries on this show. And every now and then we like to throw one in. And this is one of my personal favorites. We begin the story in May of 1952 in a periodical published by a very trustworthy source, the U.S. Coast Guard. And in 1952, the Coast Guard published a story in the Proceedings of the Merchant Marine Council detailing the mysterious incident of the Orang Madan. Orang Madan, by the way, is Dutch. It means the man from Madan. So like orangutan means the man of something. And Orang Madan means the man from Madan. So the story entitled We Sail Together included a number of incidents of misfortune at sea. From the Titanic disaster to other less famous mysteries. And here is how the U.S. Coast Guard described the mysterious incident on board the Orang Madan. Perhaps one of the most perturbing sea dramas occurred in February 1948, and remember that date. Radio silence was broken with an urgent SOS from the SS Orang Madan, a Dutch vessel, then proceeding through the Straits of Malacca. The strange distress call transmitted in Morse code eerily read, SOS from the Orang Madan. We float. All officers, including the captain, dead in chart room and on the bridge. Probably whole of crew dead. A few confused dots and dashes later, two words came through clearly. They were, I die. Then, nothing more. Later, the Orang Madan was found adrift, approximately 50 miles from her indicated position. When the vessel which had stumbled across her sent a boat over to investigate, the sailors swarming aboard the Orang Madan found a sight seldom seen. There wasn't a living person or creature on board. There were dead men everywhere. Bodies were strewn about the decks and the passageways and the chart house on the bridge. Sprawled on their backs, the frozen faces upturned to the sun with mouths gaping open and eyes staring. Remember, this is from the Coast Guard, by the way. Just want to remind you of that. The dead bodies resembled horrible caricatures. Even the ship's dog was found dead. Yet the bodies seemed to bear no sign of injury or wounds. Then, when a fire was discovered in the number four hold, she had to be abandoned. A few minutes later, an explosion followed and the Orang Madan sank. To this day, no explanation has been offered as to what might have happened to the unfortunate ship's company. I mean, what, is, what has to be a rather boring periodical, the U.S. Coast Guard's Merchant Marine Council magazine, that has to be the most exciting story ever told in that book. And maybe that's the reason that this story has taken on so much power and so much legend. And even people who have no connection to the sea whatsoever have become fascinated by this story. Now, the ship that was said to have found the Orang Madan and witnessed the explosion was the Silver Star, an American flagged vessel that did exist and did often sail the waters where the Orang Madan was said to be found. 
There is one little kink here, though. It had been renamed by 1948. And thus, this part of the story doesn't ring true. And perhaps that, that first crack in the story gives you some indication of what we might be dealing with here. Guys, I am so excited to talk about one of our very favorite sponsors, and that is HelloFresh. If you've been listening to this show for any length of time, you know that we love HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers fresh, quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week, so you can savor summer flavors right from home. If you're going away this summer, that's fine. Update your delivery address and enjoy HelloFresh at your vacation destination with just a click. Plans are flexible so they can work with your changing schedule. And there is something for everyone. Discover seasonal summer recipes like cucumber salad stuffed pita pockets, chicken sausage stuffed peppers, one of my personal favorites, Tuscan spice shrimp, and so much more. And guys, Everything is more expensive these days. You're looking to cut corners wherever you can and save some money. Well, HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant and is even cheaper than grocery shopping. That's money back in your pocket. My wife and I, we can't wait for HelloFresh to be delivered. It's a fun thing that we get to do together. We love making the recipes and we learn something. We learn something about cooking. We learn something about meal prep every single day time and we love this product and it's not just hello fresh green chef and every plate are now owned by hello fresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from there's something for everyone i love switching between the brands and now our listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with us so what are you waiting for go to hellofresh.com slash tp16 and use code tp16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts that's hellofresh.com slash tp16 code tp16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts and you'll find out why hellofresh is america's number one meal kit Guys, I don't know about you, but my wallet is feeling a little light these days. From cringing at the pump to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us all where it hurts, and it really hurts. And that's why we started using Upside. Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out, which might be everybody. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. I got to tell you, one thing I hate doing is filling up my gas tank. It's costing me $80, $90, $100 sometimes. I pop open the Upside app and I'm seeing gas stations with 30 cents off or 40 cents off every single gallon. And that means a lot to me and it can mean a lot to you. All you got to do to get started is you download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play and use our promo code PROSECUTE and you'll get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit or debit card, and you will get paid. You can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's probably why they have a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. So join us, download the free Upside app, and use promo code PROSECUTE to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code PROSECUTE. Guys, yeah, spring is coming to an end. We're rolling into summer, and it's kind of that weird between time where it can be difficult to find just the right outfit. And with every day, it seems like the weather can change at the drop of a hat. Luckily, Faraday makes it way easier. They make the perfect clothes for all seasons. Faraday is a family-run brand making high-quality, timeless clothing with modern design and functionality. It's that kind of effortless style you want every time you go digging in your closet. 
You know what I'm talking about. That set, that shirt, that dress, the one that feels like you've had for years. It's in a gorgeous print. Maybe it's vintage and it fits so well and it feels like it was made just for you. Well, that is Faraday in a nutshell. If you guys saw me at Crime Con, I was wearing Faraday. Just last week, I had to go to a training and I needed to wear something that was a little bit business, but a little bit casual. Well, I had my short sleeve breeze shirt in faded floral batik and I rolled in feeling confident and feeling good. And Faraday's so confident in the quality of their stuff, they have a lifetime guarantee of quality. They'll replace or fix your clothes forever, no matter what. Talk about making it easier to get dressed. And right now, Faraday is giving all prosecutors listeners 20% off. That's 20% off. All you have to do is head to FaradayBrand.com slash TP and use code TP at checkout to snag 20% off. All your new spring and summer staples. That's code TP at Faraday, F-A-H-E-R-T-Y, brand.com slash TP for 20% off. FaradayBrand.com slash TP. Yeah, Brett. I mean, that was such a good reminder halfway through this fantastical story that this is just a periodical story from the U.S. Coast Guard. The U.S. Coast Guard is not in the business of short stories or publications for entertainment. They are a, you know, law enforcement entity. Yeah, I think. I mean, they're military. They're military. This is a military yeah, I mean. entity. And like you said, the Marine Council is uh, something official. But this just reads like a a novel. And it's beautifully written. And it's poetic. I mean, those last words, I die. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But it almost seems so beautifully woven as a story that, like you said, that first crack in its veneer is beginning to show because of the difference in timing of what the ship's name could be. This was the first time the story appeared in English, but it was not the first time it appeared. That appearance was in a Dutch newspaper, De Locomotive, in a series of three articles beginning February 3rd, 1948. That was so wonderfully pronounced, by the way. Was it wrong? Alice. No, it's beautiful. <laughs> that, that was great. I'm glad you had to say that, not me, because I would have had no idea. I'm not even going to attempt to say the I'm name. I'm sure someone. Of the newspaper. Okay. For those of you who don't listen to the end of our episodes, all the way to the end of the songs, there are some real nuggets of fantastic bloopers. If you don't listen to the end of today's episode, I. I, I feel sorry for you. So we'll leave it at that, and you can maybe figure out later what I'm talking about. Well, let me just say this. If the if the sixth grade class is listening, maybe don't listen to the bloopers. <laughs> Parents, you can listen, but maybe sixth graders turn it off. <laughs> there's, our, there's our warning. <laughs> Anyways. I do want to say one thing before you continue. A serious note. Just because I want to keep – we're not doing a timeline this time because there's not really a timeline to do. But the timing of a lot of different things that happen in the story actually are pretty important. And this is one of them. Remember, the Coast Guard article said that this event occurred in February 1948. Well, this article from this Dutch newspaper, the series of articles about the event begins February 3rd, 1948. So the articles about what happened are actually before the timing of the ship sinking, at least as far as the Coast Guard is reporting. And you wonder, is the Coast Guard conflating when it was reported by this Dutch newspaper with when it actually happened? And that's a great point. This is kind of literary forensic analysis, seeing where these dates are popping up. Because what we do know is that the Dutch paper set the event not in 1948, as reported by the U.S. Coast Guard, but in June of 1947, 400 nautical miles southeast of the Marshall Islands, the rest of the story is essentially the same, though it includes an interview with a supposed survivor from the ship, a German who conveniently died soon after telling his story to a missionary. He claimed a cargo of sulfuric acid had leaked, killing most of the crew. 
The story was provided by a man named Silvio Shirley in Triste, Italy. Shirley was born at the turn of the 20th century and had he had been a merchant mariner in the South Pacific before apparently moving to Triste. Had he heard the story on his trips? Or did his connections provide him information he wouldn't have otherwise had? And a couple things on this. Number one, I've always wondered how to pronounce that word, that place. I always thought it was Trieste, but I've heard, I've heard it, I've heard it pronounced Trieste, other places. So I actually don't know. I'm happy to go with either one, but I was thinking Trieste in any like event, sad. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And the only reason, you know, it's one of those. Oh, you're right. They sometimes you know, say a really quick Google, as people say we should do, is Trieste. 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 So no you at all. Well, in any event, that place. The really interesting thing about this, these articles, there are three of them, as Alice said, and they're in Dutch. We were not able to find any English translations of these articles. But one of the good things about having a podcast that's heard all over the world is there are people who have the ability to translate. And I want to thank Stephanie, who translated these three articles into English for us. And we're going to post those on our website. She even did it in the same style as the newspaper. So you can feel as though you're reading the newspaper with the same pictures and everything. But it's in English. And I really think this is one of the few places you can find this story. It is pretty interesting. It's a lot more detail than what you have from the article by the Coast Guard. But the basics of the story are the same. But you also get a little bit more detail about what's going on because you have this survivor who sort of tells the story and gives you an explanation, which you didn't have in the Coast Guard story. The explanation that there's a cargo of sulfuric acid, that it's leaking, that that's what's causing people to die, and that's why you find all these people dead. And the only reason this person survived is he and a few other sailors took a lifeboat and left the boat. So they were not around when everyone died because they made the correct decision to flee. And again, Brett, that is just so awesome that if it were not for Stephanie listening to our podcast and answering our call for help, we would not know what these Dutch articles say. And so please go read them, if not for anything that this is the only place we were able to find them translated into English for those of us who don't speak Dutch. So, for decades, this was believed to be the earliest telling of the story. But in 2015, a researcher with the Nom de Internet, Estelle, discovered newspaper articles in the Yorkshire Evening News and the Daily Mirror, originating from the Associated Press from, get this, November of 1940, detailing the disaster. So originally we had a reporting in 1952 about an event that supposedly happened in February of 1948. And then we find an article starting in February of 1948 reporting that the, the event happened in June of 1947. But now we have a telling of it from November of 1940, seven years before what we thought was the, was the event. The interesting thing about the 1940 detailing of the disaster is that it did not include Shirley's name, but they did originate from Trieste, Italy. Yeah, which is interesting. Trieste or Trieste. No, or it's it's whatever. Trieste. You're right. You're totally right. Don't you don't have to pretend like I was kind of right. I wasn't right. I I don't. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't I'm right not at being all. Critical. I'm not being critical. <laughs> I was just saying. I would never be critical about pronunciation. <laughs> let's be clear. So. <laughs> Trieste keeps coming up, and we know this guy was in Trieste, and we know he was a mariner. So, clearly, Shrelly has some connection to this. It's interesting that you have him telling the story in 1947, 1948, both times, and he's setting the story after the war. We assume it's him. His name comes up. And then you have this story from before the war, or at least right at the beginning of the war. And what's the interesting thing about this, we're going to talk a lot about what happened here. And one of the questions you have to tackle is, does this ship even exist? Before you can decide what happened to the ship, you have to decide, does it exist? There's not as much evidence of its existence as you would like. You have these newspaper stories, but the details are so all over the place. Most importantly, when this happened. And I got to tell you, 
1947-48 didn't do much for me. Didn't mean it couldn't happen then, but it just didn't do much for me. But 1940 changes things because that is a time of incredible turmoil around the world. It's a time where war has just broken out in Europe, albeit I think at this point, 1940, November 1940, France has fallen. War is raging in Europe. The British are, are sort of hunkering down for what's going to be a, a tough fight and a long fight. In the Pacific, where this story is going on, you have the Japanese who are invading through sort of Southeast Asia. They've already invaded China. They've taken over a lot of places. They're kicking the British out of places like Singapore. And the Americans, although not entering into the war, have imposed an embargo, a blockade, to keep shipping from going to Japan and supplying the Japanese war machine. So what you have in the Pacific are a lot of people running goods that aren't supposed to be, especially weapons, dangerous materials, things like that. We're going to talk more about that as we go on, but it, it's a situation where you can imagine something like a ship, sort of a mysterious ship, something happens to it, and whereas in a post-war period or in a period where there's not a lot going on, that would make a lot of news, it would have a lot of focus, there should be a lot of stories about it. In the middle of a war where ships are being sunk left and right by German U-boats, maybe it doesn't make as much of a story as you would think, and that allows it to kind of go under the radar more than would be expected. Brett, I'm sorry. I'm just stop I'm stopping you for just a moment because I love these historical mysteries because you are a stinking encyclopedia. Oh, well, thank you, Alice. But keep going. <laughs> Please keep going. So let's talk about the unusual things. The SOS calls. You know, you're reading stuff like this. You're reading stories like this. There are things that kind of should immediately jump out to you. And when you read this initial story, the the SOS call is something that jumps out to you. Now, it's not surprising that a ship in distress would issue an SOS an SOS call. But the contents of these calls, they are something else. So let's read that first distress call again. SOS from Orang Madan. We float. All officers, including the captain, dead in chart room and on the bridge. Probably whole of crew dead. Now there are a couple things that immediately jump out to you about this SOS call. First, it has the perfect amount of detail for a creepy story but both too much and too little detail for an actual distress call. For instance, it does not reveal what is wrong with the ship, what distress has befallen it, or what it needs from passing ships. On the other hand, it has a lot of detail about the fact everyone is dead. You probably could have covered that in a few words. And if you were really in distress, it's questionable whether you type out enough dots and dashes to tell that part of the story. Remember, this is being sent over Morse code. We know that because part of the story says that there was a confused, there's a section which was just confused dots and dashes, which didn't even really make sense. So you're literally telling the story over a wireless radio in Morse code. Dot, 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 dash, dot, dot, dot. That's what you're doing. And that's why the confused that's why the confused Morse code doesn't really make sense because those could just be essentially typos or why do you know it's confused? It could just be it was nothing, right? Someone someone fell on the key on, on the, the Morse code tapper or they got confused in the way that they were typing in terms of misspelling something by the dots and dashes. But to say that it's confused is strange because it would be confused if the words that were coming out didn't make sense. This reminds me so much of an H.P. Lovecraft story. Those of you who like horror, I'm a big fan of H.P. Lovecraft. And H.P. Lovecraft often has this situation where, in fact, there's one story which is tremendous called The Statement of Randolph Carter. And it puts Randolph Carter in a very similar situation to this, where he is on, he's on a telephone with someone. They're sort of investigating something, and they've got... A telephone system set up because this is set in like the 1920s so they couldn't have walkie-talkies or anything like that and so they're sort of unspooling this wire down into this cave and the one guy's telling the other guy what he's seen and obviously he's trying to relay stuff to him 
but he can't really describe what he's seeing. He's leaving stuff out. And you as the reader are, it's as if you're sitting there with that guy on the other end of the phone trying to figure out what this guy sees. And in a situation like that, you're going to have parts where, you know, in, you know, parts where he's saying things that you just can't quite understand, you can't hear, they don't quite make sense, and it adds to the heightened sense of terror. But as Alice points out, this is a really weird thing to do with Morse code. So you just, like, randomly started typing dots and dashes for no particular reason? How does that, why would that even happen? And, you know, you're in all this distress and you're taking the time to lay out all of these words where you're having to type out each individual letter to tell this story. That's just not going to happen. But really, it's the ending that takes the cake. So just imagine this. They got the guy with his, ra his radio. He's typing out Morse code. And then how does he end it? I die. O okay. That was very conscientious of him. To let us know in Morse code that he is taking his last breath before he dies. Just that's that is such a such a a flourish of a fiction writer. It really does sound like that because remember, the way Morse code is used, especially because it's dots and dashes, you can't hear tone, you can't hear intonation, you don't hear someone's voice. The purpose and the way Morse code is used is for short to the point messages because it's difficult to Morse code out. It's not like a keyboard where you have pre-laid out, you know, autocorrect as you're typing. The word is corrected for you and, and, and filled for you. Rather, it is a way to communicate the briefest of messages that are to the point and usually to do with the actual case at hand. So there's usually not even full sentences in Morse code. They cut out unnecessary words. As long as you know what's going on, that's good enough. You know, I think of the way my mom texts. My mom is just not a very good texter. And so she drops out all unnecessary words and it would say something like, food, carrots. I'm like, you want me to buy carrots? <laughs> is that what you want? And I kind of have to read between the lines. But that's how Morse code is typically used. There, Everything is so truncated and they, everyone knows everything's truncated. And so they, they've learned to, to read how the other person is communicating with kind of the truncated language. There's no truncated language over here. These are written in full sentences. So for example, SOS from Orang Madan, it wouldn't say that. It would say, SOS, Orang Madan, if anything. Why the we float? Those are just wasted dots and dashes. and Or just a straight SOS, you know, and then coordinates. That's usually what you see in Morse code. If you can go look up, you know, these SOS messages in the Naval Archives, and they're really interesting, but you'll see how short they are. Yeah, we float. I mean, it's pretty clear you're floating if you're sending an SOS. Like you said, you don't need the from. All officers, including the captain, dead. That might be fine. I mean, that's still a lot. But then in chart room and on the bridge, do we need to know where they are when they died? I mean, you're right. It's just, it's the kind of detail you would want, like I said, to tell the story. But the detail that you would expect, it's just not really, it's not really there. And then the, the we die thing. And it's not just the SOS. The description of, of the deaths of the sailors and where their bodies are found and the absence of some of the crew. It's just another thing that sounds fictional. I'll read you this section again. There were dead men everywhere. Bodies were strewn about the decks and the passageways and the chart house on the bridge. So you can imagine, you know, it's one thing for one person to die. It's another thing to find dead people everywhere and with no cause of death. They haven't been shot. They haven't been stabbed. They haven't been beaten up. There's nothing about them that makes them look as if they should be dead, and specifically sprawled on their backs. So all of these men died, on, fell on their backs, with their frozen faces upturned to the sun, with mouths gaping open and eyes staring, as if they were all you know, looking upon the thing in the sky that killed them. And they're all on their backs in death. I mean, and then the fact that the dog, even the dog was found dead is a particular flourish that I really enjoy. It, it is quite the flourish. Again, the point of the SOS is to get help. So knowing that everyone's dead, okay, that maybe sets the scene, but here you think it would be something like, 
bring oxygen, bring medicine, bring doctor, thing, things like that. Not, not, and it's not even a very helpful detail of the maladies. If you explain this at the ER, they would be like, what? I, I don't know how to help you in, in this instance. So the multiple tellings in different times and places, we've already detailed some of those. What does it all mean? Since it was first told, whenever that is, the story has been told as taking place in multiple times and locations, 1940, 1947, 1948, the Marshall Islands, the Solomon Islands. This is yet another tell that this is an urban legend. Whatever kernel of truth may have laid at the heart of the story at one time, now it has been manipulated and adjusted by tellings and retellings in seaside bars over pints of beer and whiskey. This doesn't mean there's no truth to the story, but the story that we have and the one that keeps being told over and over is likely quite different from whatever the original might be. And you see this a lot. Um, the reason that it's a telltale sign if you have different times and um, locations that this is kind of a, a, a tall tale that is spun off the rails from its origins is because you fit these tall tales to your audience at hand. So there, maybe, maybe this audience, you know, the Marshall Islands resonate more. And maybe in another bar, it's the Solomon Islands that really resonate with them. They're like, we've all been there. We know what that is. And also the year as well. Because obviously, if you're telling the story in 1948, it's it's much more compelling to say this just happened nary six months ago rather than in some time far, far a long time ago. It doesn't affect you because it's probably just because of how long ago it was. There's no immediacy and no closeness of the danger. And so you can see how over time these tall tales are changed a little bit to grip the audience that's listening to it. And it's important to note that doesn't mean there's not truth in this story. And not a lot of people cover the story in podcasts because obviously it's not a true crime story. But some of the ones who do, they point to these facts and say, see, it's made up. They Obviously, it's made up, you know, no one types out, I die. Well, it's kind of like the Lighthouse case that we did all the way back at the beginning of our podcast. There was a lot of embellishment of that story, but there was a Lighthouse and there were three men who went missing. Like, that story is true. The things that are built around it are not. And the question that we have to grapple with here is even as we start to see that there's obviously some embellishment and some additions to the story, is there a kernel of truth, or was it made out of whole cloth? And that's, that's the difficulty. That's the hard thing to figure out. Now, one of the strikes against this being a true story is the lack of witnesses. You'd think... Every sailor who was involved in this would be talking about what they saw. Every telling of the story has a ship finding the Orang Madon and a number of sailors witnessing its demise, whatever that is. And a number of sailors seeing the crew on the deck of the ship. And that makes you wonder why are there so few personal accounts? We have Shrelly and Trieste. We could imagine that someone told him the story. But why aren't there other people saying, yeah, I was on that ship too. And I saw the same thing. This is a story so good that no self-respecting sailor could stop himself from telling it if he'd been there and seen it. And yet, we don't have those stories. All we have are a few publications from anonymous sources without anyone ever coming forward and saying, I was there. Now, there isn't a possible explanation for this, though. Although it is often said that the Silver Star was the ship to see the Orang Madon, we don't know that for sure. And we know that at least by the latest telling, the Silver Star's name had changed. Now, when you get to the 1940 tellings, there, there was a ship called the Silver Star. So it's possible the Silver Star could have been involved there. But maybe another ship is, is the ship that saw this. And the Silver Star just kind of got added on later on for whatever reason. You know, maybe Shirley looked out his window and there was a Silver Star parked in port. And he thought, oh, I'll mention the Silver Star to give it some veracity. So we don't know that. And if it were another ship, there's a good chance that the men who would have seen the ship didn't live long afterwards. We've pushed this story all the way back to 1940. It couldn't have happened any later than 1940 because there are reports about it in 1940. That was during World War II. 
the casualty rate, and this is a crazy fact that people that people don't appreciate. The casualty rate of the merchant marine, so the guys who were sailing cargo ships across the Pacific and across the Atlantic, was the highest of any branch of the military, averaging a loss of 33 ships a week. Oh my goodness. So every week, 33 ships were going down during World War II. So it's maybe not hard to imagine that there wouldn't be many eyewitnesses left. And that's amazing because I think it's been well documented how many planes we lost. What is the movie, the the book Unbroken? The number of planes that were just being, you know, because of the the early stages of air flight and also the dangers of shooting down planes, but to lose 33 ships a week, it really feels like we're losing all our men on these ships and therefore also all our witnesses. The fact that the Orang Madan does not appear in naval records is also really interesting because there is no record of the ship Orang Madan in any record of naval ships for this period or otherwise. Furthermore, the Silver Star, the ship that supposedly found it, does not mention the Orang Madan in its logs. So this is very interesting that, and you can go look at naval archives yourself, but Typically, there is a record of every ship that sails, and maybe the Orang Madan had a different name. Maybe for some reason the records are under seal, or Occam's Razor, it might not exist as Orang Madan because there is no record for it. And it's interesting that it's not just this period because, as you can tell, the period of the story spans about a decade. And so no no records of any time show a ship named Orang Madan. And the interesting thing about this, once again, if this were 1947, I think this is very significant. The fact that there's no name of this ship would be something you might think matters. But if you push back to 1940, and if you read that Dutch account, the supposed survivor, who is a German, talks about this, not this specifically, but says it was a chaotic time and the ships were constantly changing their names. And they were doing that because, once again, they're running cargo that's illegal. So you could imagine a ship running cargo. Maybe it gets sighted by a warship and it manages to escape. Well, once it gets to port, it might want to change its name because if it sees that warship again and they're like, well, there's the Orang Madan. We saw that one a month ago breaking the blockade. Let's board it. Like, so you could imagine ships changing their names all the time. So it might be the case that the reason it was never registered is because it's essentially a privateer, a smuggler, a pirate. You know, I mean, the Millennium Falcon might not have been registered in the Empire's records either. So I don't necessarily know how significant this is. Obviously, if there were a ship called the Orang Madan in the naval records, that would be helpful. But the fact that it's not in there doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't exist. The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want like comprehensive and collision coverage, or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Guys, if you're like me, you struggle with sinus pain, congestion, pressure, allergies, runny nose, all of those symptoms that can just drive you crazy. And that's where Tivic ClearUp comes in. ClearUp is a revolutionary compact handheld device that provides a safe and drug-free way to clear congestion and relieve sinus pain. Tivic ClearUp is FDA-approved, non-invasive, 
and delivers therapeutic benefits safely and comfortably. It's also rechargeable, reusable, which means it's environmentally friendly over the massive waste of disposable products. And one of the significant benefits is that ClearUp can be used as often as needed, at work, in the middle of the night, or while traveling. Relieving your pain and congestion has never been easier. So how does ClearUp work? How does the device treat pain? Will it work as well as medication? Here's the science. The Tivit ClearUp uses a propriety waveform of microelectric currents and specific frequencies to target inflammation at the nerve, which results in shrinking swollen tissue in the sinus cavity. For a lot of users, ClearUp works when nothing else does, but can also be used as part of a regimen you already have. Use it with your current allergy and pain medication or in replacement without the worry of drug interactions or chemical side effects. ClearUp provides a non-chemical, non-addicting, and non-drowsy solution to target pain and congestion at the source. Not just masking the symptoms like most traditional products, simply glide ClearUp slowly along the cheek, nose, and over the brow for five minutes to experience quick relief of congestion and sinus pain for up to six hours. Give ClearUp a try with a 60-day risk-free trial. Go to TivicHealth.com, that's T-I-V-I-C, H-E-A-L-T-H dot com and use promo code PROSECUTORS22 to receive $20 off plus free shipping on your clear up. Again, that's TivicHealth.com and promo code PROSECUTORS22 to receive $20 off plus free shipping on your clear up device. Guys, we've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you really should be listening to. And I know that every day somebody tells you that you just have to listen to some podcast, and you nod and say sure, and then you never listen to it. Don't let that happen here. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening even inside your own brain. Each episode is a conversation with a different, fascinating guest. And when I say there's something for everyone here, I really mean that. One of my favorite episodes is with Sammy the Bull Gravano. If you're into true crime like me, that's a not miss. Or you can hear Amanda Knox tell her story in her own words. In one episode, Jordan talks to a hostage negotiator from the FBI who offers techniques on how to get people to like you and trust you, which sounds useful and disturbing at the same time. But that's the Jordan Harbinger show. Jordan's always focused on pulling useful, practical insights out of his brilliant guest. And we're not talking about pop psychology or wishy-washy self-help stuff here. The episodes are loaded with bits of wisdom that you can use to legitimately change your mind and improve your life right away. We really enjoy this show, and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Let's talk about the explosions, because... This is something that we see in the retelling of the story. At the conclusion of each time the story is told, the ship conveniently explodes. This accounts for the fact that no one ever saw the ship again, and it's also another sign that this is an urban legend. Because the fact of an explosion is just too convenient. It forces us to accept the story without a single piece of evidence other than the eyewitness account. Put that together with the fact that the eyewitnesses themselves are mysterious, and you have to wonder if this story ever happened. It's a very convenient ending to this mysterious story because nothing is left to test what killed the, the dog and the entire crew, including the captain. Nothing is left to even prove that the boat existed because you can't possibly know since it exploded and then sank. So it's, it's just a very convenient, it could have been true. Except that if it were an urban legend, it's a very convenient ending to the story because it can't, you can't test the story. And just remember back to the Mary Celeste. If the Mary Celeste, after the ship had found it, suddenly sank you know, beneath the waves, we would probably doubt a lot of the facts that we were given. Even though we would know the ship existed because there's more evidence of its existence, some of the mysterious things about the ship that they found, you might be like, yeah, I'm sure that's what, I'm sure that's what it looked like. Yeah, there was a rope trailing behind it or whatever. 
And you wouldn't know because the ship sank. But in that case, they did what you do when you find a ship floating around. You grab onto it and you take it back to port. And if that had happened here, obviously we would know the Orang Madan existed and that would take out some of the mystery. But conveniently, it blows up at the end. So we're there just long enough. We managed to get people on the ship, go all over the ship, find all these dead people, see them staring up into the sun, see the dead dog, and then, oh no, we got to get off and the ship blows up and sinks to the bottom of the ocean. So, very convenient. In 1959, this story takes a strange twist. On December 5th, 1959, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, received a letter from a man named C.H. Mark regarding the Orang Madan incident. Now, there's some things about this to know. Number one, it's unclear who Mark addressed the letter to, as that actually remains classified to this day. That's right. For reasons that are unclear, this letter was classified. And in fact, it was only released in 2003. Now, Mark did not work for the CIA. He wasn't a CIA agent. He's sometimes described as an assistant to the director or something along those lines, but that's not true. He was a civilian who lived in Arizona, and this was not the only letter he'd sent to the CIA. Now, there's little other evidence about Mark available, who he was or, or why he was sending these letters, and it's easy to just dismiss him as a kook who's writing random letters to the CIA. But here's the problem. If that's true, if he's a kook, why did they classify his letter, and what was it that he wrote that they decided needed to stay hidden for more than 40 years. That's the first interesting thing about this. The second interesting thing about this is we didn't find this in our research. This was actually found by the sixth grade class of Lidditz Elementary. So shout out to those, those guys who found this and gave it to us so we were able to bring it to you. How amazing is that, Brett? I thought we had done all our research, but when they pulled this out during our meeting, I could not believe it. I was so impressed by their research abilities. And I know this story pretty well, and I'd never heard that before. So I was like, what? The CIA? <laughs> so interesting stuff. And this is a great point because, you know, classifications are something that are continually assessed. And if something no longer needs to be classified, it is declassified. So it's frowned upon to keep things classified unnecessarily. So the fact that it stayed classified for so long is just a complete mystery. I, I don't know what the answer is, especially because we when we do see it, it, it doesn't, it's not apparent on its face why it's classified. It doesn't seem to contain war secrets or national, national security elements within it. Yeah, it, it makes you think that something he said in the letter was closer to the truth than the CIA wanted the average person to know. So he might have been a kook. He wasn't a CIA agent. And nothing he was writing was a national secret. But maybe he kind of got close to it. And he thought that the Orang Madan, if you understood what happened to it, and we'll post the letter on the, uh, the website so you can read it, if you understood how or what happened to it, that it might reveal some other secrets of the sea and maybe even some things related to UFOs and that kind of thing. So it's an interesting letter. No idea why it was classified. And no idea why it was classified for so long. One other sort of little interesting thing. There was no insurance payout on the Orang Madan. Some people have pointed this as the definitive proof that it did not exist because money is everything. And if your ship sank, you'd want your insurance payment. But once again, 1946, 47 makes sense. 1940 smuggling stuff for somebody. You can understand why there wouldn't be an insurance payment or maybe any insurance at all. So I don't think that's as much of a slam dunk debunking of this as some people might think. So let's go to the theories then. And I think the first theory we have to address because it's the most likely one. And I know you've all been thinking about since we started this episode is this was clearly the work of sea monsters. Maybe the ship was attacked by sea monsters. True, the recorded accounts don't include sea monsters, but honestly, they don't include much of anything in explanation for what happened to the crew. Still, 
as much as we like that theory, it's probably not sea monsters. But we had to address it. I wish it, it were sea monsters. I know. I wish it were. And you know what? None of the sixth graders at Lidditz Elementary fell for this one either. So we thought it was a fun theory. They did not. And they're probably right. The problem was, you know, if there'd been like sucker marks or something <laughs> on the semen. The or maybe sightings dead, of, you know, sightings of Loch Ness monsters, monsters in this area. Yeah. You know. But Kraken. But maybe, maybe, Brett, if not sea monsters, what about aliens? Hey, aliens are back. It's been a while. We since haven't we've had talked aliens. about aliens in a long time. <laughs> and well, although we often think of aliens as occurring over land, there is a long and less known history of aliens at sea. I bet you guys didn't know that. Sometimes described as USOs, unidentified submerged objects. The theory goes that if aliens wanted to remain undetected, what better way than to wait underwater, the area of the Earth least explored? Maybe the aliens zapped the Orang Madan with some sort of radiation ray that made it blow up, and then they flew away. Maybe? I guess? But the problem with this theory is that, much like the sea monster theory, there's just no evidence for it. So why go over these theories at all? Are we just wasting your time? Well, no, we're not just trying to waste time. There are two reasons we've talked about sea monsters and aliens. One, they are out there as theories. And two, considering them and their flaws is applicable to any case. Too often people develop theories based on their imagination rather than evidence. And they think of something that could have happened, at least theoretically, and treat that as a viable theory until someone proves it wrong. But just because we can imagine it happening a certain way doesn't mean it's likely or even possible. That's why we've actually presented these theories for you and explained how there's absolutely no evidence for it. Now, we've not shied away from aliens in past episodes. You're going to have to go dig and find out which ones. So it's not that we're dismissing them out of hand, but rather looking at the evidence we have here. Since we started this podcast, this is something we come back to again and again. And it's not just aliens and sea monsters. There are lots of theories about every case we talk about. You can come up with a theory. Well, maybe this is what happened. Well, maybe it is, but there's no reason to think that's what happened. You know, do aliens exist? I don't know. Maybe it was aliens, but there's no proof that it's aliens. So, to me, like I said, when it's aliens, people roll their eyes. When it's some other theory that someone comes up with that doesn't actually have any factual support, but that you can imagine, people write whole books on it. And some of the other cases that we've covered. So, anyways, it's always good to come back to aliens. And, you know, as Alice said, we've, uh, we've considered aliens pretty seriously in some of our cases. So, those of you who are new to the show, you'll have to go back and listen to those. So the most likely, in reality, if this ship existed and it sank, the most likely thing that happened, particularly given the timeline, is that it was carrying contraband for the Japanese or the Germans or possibly the Americans. It's a little unclear, depending on the time frame. Any of those parties could have been involved. The Japanese were getting supplies past the American blockade. The Germans obviously could have been attempting to supply the Japanese, or maybe for some reason, were bringing cargo from the east over to Europe. And it could be the Americans because the United States was not involved at the war at that time, at least officially, but they certainly were doing things to support the Chinese who were fighting against the Japanese and other people in the South Pacific, the Australians, who were attempting to keep the Japanese advance from continuing. And these would have been weapons. It's those of you who know the story of the Lusitania from 1917 in World War One. The Lusitania was hit by a German submarine, and when it was hit, there was a amazing explosion. And for years, people wondered what in the world that must have been some torpedo. Well, in reality, the Lusitania, which was a passenger liner, was supposed to not be a target of war, was also not supposed to be carrying weapons. Well, of course it was, because by putting weapons on a passenger ship, you guaranteed that the ship wouldn't get sunk and those weapons would get through. So when the, when the German U-boat shot its torpedo at this ship, which it wasn't supposed to do, these weapons ignited, the ship sank. 
Similar thing here. The Americans are not supposed to be involved. They certainly were. So you could imagine it could have been American munitions that were being carried on this ship, for instance. The other possibility, and this was one that the kids brought up a lot, there's something called Unit 731, which the Japanese set up in World War II. It's, it's far less known than some of the things the Nazis and the Germans were doing. Most people know about the Holocaust, the, the horrors of Dr. Mingala and the experiments that people were doing uh, on human beings in the European theater by the Nazis. Well, the Japanese were doing similar terrible things in China. Unit 731 was set up specifically for that purpose. The Japanese were doing things like experimenting on Chinese prisoners, giving them the bubonic plague and seeing what would happen to them, doing really just insane things like freezing an arm and then thawing it to see what would happen sewing one an arm from one person onto another i mean really just awful terrible horrible things and they needed supplies as well and so people have speculated that possibly this could be a ship carrying those kind of supplies in any event whatever whatever the ship was carrying it would have been dangerous it would have been volatile it could have been something like poison gases or disease something that would kill the sailors quickly and if you remember back to that story in the italian newspaper it gives a reason it's a sulfuric acid it was in the cargo hold one of the containers had broken and it sort of spread through the ship and slowly killed all the men on the ship and you could imagine something like that happening yeah that i thought this was such the especially the sixth graders um presented this theory so coherently and had done so much additional research on this. Maybe they should do a podcast on Unit 731 because I thought they did some great, great research there. Now, what if the Orang Madan never existed? This is an urban legend. It was dreamed up by a bored sailor, some newspaper man looking to make a quick buck. Then there was no ship, no explosion, no cargo, no SOS call. And in fact, this is one of the most popular positions because there are so many differing accounts of the story and no hard evidence and no record of the Yerang Madan, it, you can see why one of the most popular positions is that this is just that, a tall tale and nothing more. And maybe it never in fact existed. Yeah, and this is definitely the most popular position. I think it's a position most people land on. This was a weird thing that happened at the turn of the 20th century. There were just a lot of people who got their jollies on writing fictional stories, entirely fictional stories, you know, actual fake news, and getting it into newspapers. That's what they like to do. There's a famous instant of this in like the 19 teens where there was a story that ran widely, I think including in the New York Times, that Egyptian artifacts had been discovered in the Grand Canyon, in a cave in the Grand Canyon. And it cited to the Smithsonian, and it cited some people, some Smithsonian researchers who had gone down the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon, and they'd found all these Egyptian artifacts, and it led them to believe that the Egyptians had been to the New World, you know, before Columbus, before Native Americans, anybody, right? And this was sort of a sensational story, and then it just died out. And it turned out that the person who fed them that story, had actually done that a lot. And he tried to come up with stories that were fantastical, but just just enough realism that the newspapers would bite and publish it. So it needed to be fantastic, so it wasn't boring, but not so fantastic that the newspaper would know it was obviously false. Now, this that's a pretty crazy story, the Egyptians in the Grand Canyon. But nevertheless, they were able to get it published. And that's something that happened. And some people think that this Silvio, this Silvio Shrelly guy essentially just made this story up, managed to get it out in the 1940s. It didn't get as big as he wanted it to, so he embellished it even more, fed it to some Italian newspapers in 1947, and then it eventually was picked up by the Coast Guard and became the legend that it is. So it is certainly possible that this story never happened, but... It is also possible that it did. And we talked earlier about that British researcher who found articles from November 1940 in British newspapers that talked about this. 
And I decided to go into the British newspaper archives and see if I could find a more fulsome story because it just felt like the stories that they found were leaving details out. And it made me think this was an AP wire story and that there would be a wire story that was longer and more detailed. And I was able to find one in the Hampshire Telegraph. And I'm going to read you this story in the Hampshire Telegraph from November 1940, which I think is probably the earliest publication of this story. Story of Weird Sea Tragedy. An eyewitness account of the last phase of one of the world's most mysterious sea tragedies has been brought to Trieste by a merchant marine officer who went to the rescue of the steamer Orang Madan off the Solomon Islands last November. So this puts this actual event in November 1939. So the Second World War began on September 1st, 1939 in Europe. It began in China when the Japanese invaded in 1933 and had basically been going on in the Pacific in sort of a smoldering war since then. But November of 1939 would have been a very active time as all the major powers were gearing up for the war that had already started, but that was about to really get underway. Trieste, Thursday. A weird SOS was flashed from the Orang Madan asking for a doctor urgently, and later she asked for a warship. When this officer arrived on the scene, he found officers and members of the crew lying dead on the deck with no visible wounds, but had to make a hurried escape when a series of unexplained explosions set fire to the ship and burned her to the waterline. Quote, we were about 20 miles southwest of the Solomon Islands on the night of November 13th, 1939, said the officer, when we intercepted the following signal. So, once again, before we've been kind of all over the place with the date. Here we have an exact date when this supposedly happened. November 13th, 1939. When we intercepted the following signal. SOS from the steamship Orang Madan. Beg ships for the shortwave wireless get touch doctor urgent. Now that SOS, we talked about all the problems with the other SOS, right? This one sounds much more legit. SOS from the steamship Orang Madan, beg ships with shortwave wireless get touch doctor. So leaving out some words that you might use if you were just writing this, a specific request. There's an SOS. It's their Rang Madan. We need ships with a shortwave wireless to get in touch with a doctor. Urgent. This reads just much more like what we were talking about. Go look at some Naval Archive records. You'll see that this falls right in line with what these SOSs actually look like. The SOS in front of the appeal for a doctor meant a case of exceptional gravity. We went into action immediately with our shortwave set relaying the call for help. Medical stations in Germany, Rome and France replied almost simultaneously to our call. We informed the Orang Madan we were in communication with various medical centers and asked her to transmit her request. After a few minutes, the Orang Madan replied with the auxiliary transmitter. Probably second officer dead, other members, crew also killed. Disregard medical consultation, SOS, urgent assistance, warship. So once again, just missing words. Still a little bit more detail than maybe you would expect, but still just missing words, basically saying, we need you to get here immediately. We need a warship, which is interesting. The ship then gave her position, said the officer, and went on. Crew has. At that point, the message broke off with words which we failed to make out. Still, we repeated the Orang Madan's message with our wireless and annulled the appeal to the medical centers. We made wild guesses at what happened. Mutiny, piracy, prisoners revolt. We calculated we should reach the Orang Madan at full speed in about 16 hours. Meanwhile, an American torpedo boat signaled that she was on the way to the distressed ship and hoped to reach her within 24 hours. A terrifying sight. At the end of 16 hours, at about 2 in the afternoon, we sighted a big ship on the horizon. It flew no flag, was listing slightly to starboard, and the propeller motionless. From our bridge, we could see it was the Orang Madan. There was no sign of life on the quarter deck, and no reply to our shouts through a megaphone. We launched two lifeboats, with eight men in each, and rowed across to the Orang Madan and boarded her. Then we saw a terrifying sight. Bodies of sailors were lying about on the deck. 
We could find no sign of a wound on any of them. Death seemed to have taken them by surprise at their post. On the captain's bridge, we found the body of the second officer. Again, there was no sign of a wound. We counted 12 bodies, three of them deck officers. We reckon the Orang Madan should have had a crew of about 40. Explosion and Fire The captain decided to search the officers' quarters, but just then we heard an explosion in the ship's hold. A column of smoke belched from the second hatchway. We abandoned the ship immediately, and we rowed back to our own. The explosions were repeated at even short intervals, so we withdrew to a safer distance. Soon nothing was left but the blazing hulk. The next day, the fire burned itself out after having destroyed the ship's whole superstructure and erased every trace of the drama. We drifted closer as she slowly but relentlessly went under. So that's the end of the story. It then says the Associated Press was informed in London that nothing is known here of any ship named Orang Madan. It's just so refreshing to even the way this is written that you've just read reads much more like a an account, a real life account of what happened. It doesn't have the fantastical elements of the first story that we heard at the beginning of this episode. Right. It still has some dramatic things. There were a lot of dead people and there were some people missing, but you know, the SOS message makes much more sense. There's no, we die even. And as you were saying, the way everything is described, the way the, the fact the ship, the way it burned, it burned at superstructure, the explosions, the description of a lot of the different things, everything just sounds more realistic and more more in line with the story you would actually expect if the story were true. And, and the fact, as we said earlier, what is wrong with the earlier stories? They give you detail so that you, you know, you, your imagination is inflamed, right? But they don't give you any details that you could use to either prove or disprove the story. This one does. And in fact, it gives you two pieces of information that have never before been revealed, as far as I know. I haven't really seen them anywhere. The specific date of both the sinking and the SOS call, and probably the most important fact of all, the fact that an American destroyer responded to the SOS. That means if this ship exists, there is a record of it somewhere. And when we first started working this story up, it was the middle of COVID. I reached out to the Navy archives to see whether or not they knew which ships would be operating in this area of sort of the South Pacific in 1939. Unfortunately, the logs of basically every ship in the Navy are available from 1941 on. So the Second World War on. The logs of ships before 1941, however, are still in paper. So you got to actually go look at them, which I've not been able to do. But if you looked at all the destroyers, torpedo boats operating in the South Pacific in 1939, and you looked at those dates, I think you would be able to essentially definitively determine whether this happened. If you can't find this, if you can't find it, it doesn't definitively mean it didn't happen because it's hard to prove a negative. But it certainly would be a big strike against it. But there may be a log book sitting in the basement of the Naval Archives from a destroyer that nobody ever cared to look at because nothing ever happened to it. And on November 13th or whatever it is, 1939, it says, Received distress call from Orang Madan. And if you saw that, you would know that this ship existed. Or I would go so far as to say, Received distress call from a ship. Right? We could, ship, we could get closer right. because maybe that's not the name. And so we have not heard back from the Navy archives because understandably they have a lot more important things than to look through the warship logs of November 1939. But all of you listening are now on a race. This is the greatest race of all yes. time. Whoever is in DC, go to the Navy archives and see if you can locate these records we're talking about. Go forth. We are not there right now. We will be there eventually, so we might beat you, but I hope you beat us. And if you find the answer, email us right away, and we will do an update based on your research because 
this case can be solved potentially, and it could be you who solves it. And we're telling you, this is like National Treasure style. We're telling you where the records are. You just have to go find them within the Navy archives within in D.C. And one area of inquiry I'll already cut off for you, the Associated Press. I did reach out to the Associated Press. Very helpful people. And they looked into their archives of wire stories from 1939 to see if they could find the original wire story related to this. Because it's pretty clear that there was a wire story that was then these various newspapers across England are just taking from that wire story, which is what happens. I mean, that's how, that's what the AP is. You notice it mentions the Associated Press in this story. They were unable to find the original wire. There's a couple possibilities there. Number one, it was 1940. There was a war going on. Their archives are not quite perfect from that period, particularly in Europe. The second possibility and something that happened a lot in that period in this war reporting period is people would use the AP and act as if they work for the AP because obviously the Associated Press carries a lot of cachet. So it's possible this story was presented as an AP news story, but wasn't. But either way, the AP does not have the original story that resulted in these stories that you see across England. But yes, get out there, find the story, and then we'll all be famous. But <laughs> good luck. Good luck on your, your hunt. Indeed. Well, I think that is all we have on the ghost ship Orang Madan, the great mystery of what happened to it. I have to say, Alice, I have really enjoyed recording this episode with you. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you tonight. We do want to hear from you guys what you think, and if you've discovered the answer to this mystery, at Prosecutors Pod for Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, prosecutorspod at gmail.com for all your thoughts queries and answers when you find that logbook i want you to make a copy and send it to me hello to all of you listening on patreon to this ad free and early so glad to have you guys support and i hope all of you whether you're on patreon or not will listen to our new podcast the prosecutors legal briefs where we dive in to the law and to the current events that involve the law well alice do you have anything else you want to add before we sign off Huge thank you again to the sixth grade class of Lidditz Elementary. It has been a joy covering this really twice with you, Brett. Once with the class and now recording based on all of their great research. So reach out to us. We love interacting with you guys. And good luck to the rising seventh grade class. Yes, good luck to you guys. Thank you so much. We could not have done this without you. All right, guys, well, we will be back next week with a new case, new questions, and hopefully new answers. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutor. Let's see it if I can find how to pronounce that. Lit yeah. Lit tits. Lit -its. That could make the, that's it could set the kids at Twitter if it's not really lit tits and we call it lit tits. <laughs> lit <-its. laughs> lit I feel like lit tits is like a. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> we're not going to be, we're not going to be sixth graders here, but lit tits just feels like a, uh, an, an old school SNL, um, Jeopardy episode. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Alex, Trebek, Le Tits for 500. Le Tits. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, are you like yeah. super happy today? No, I'm just, I just, like I said, you're intoxicated. I am intoxicated by your voice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm just happy to talk to you. I don't know. Well, maybe it's because so, it's, it's a little later than we normally. It is a little. It's, a, it's, a, it's like ten minutes later. But I hear what you're saying. Later is later. All this month, stream the funniest films for free on Pluto TV. Watch comedy classics like Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, and Mean Girls. Or drop in for a Tyler Perry marathon with a Medea family funeral and Medea's witness protection. Pluto TV also has hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and TV shows like Get Shorty, Be Cool, Key and Peel, Comedy and Color, and more. And no contracts, no subscriptions, no fees, no joke. So download the Pluto TV app on your favorite streaming device and start laughing today. Pluto TV, drop in, watch free.